Hosanna to the king. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us. Save us, O king. Son of David. Can you imagine what happened on that week when Jesus came on that Sunday morning? Can you imagine how the crowds cried out in anticipation for the fulfillment of the prophecies? Children running. Religious leaders afraid of what, what could happen if Rome heard that there is another king, a son of David. The turmoil in Jerusalem is a sign of the turmoil in our hearts, isn't it? But that word, Hosanna, what does Hosanna mean? Hmm. It's kind of like one of those words that we use, but sometimes we don't really think about what it really means, right? Hosanna means Oh, save us. Save us. And that was a, a, a cry out in the Psalms of desperation to the king coming, saying, Lord, get us out of this brokenness. Lord, get us out of this place. Bring the kingdom. The Psalms, the prophets, the law prophesied that one day there would be a king whose coming would make everything right again. Remember what Isaiah says, chapter 9, verse 6? We use it in Christmas all the time. For unto us... A child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His kingdom will be forever, and his peace will have no end. Come save us. Let me ask you this, do you want peace? Do you want a kingdom that will never end? Do you want this king that has come to save us? Or does it make you oh, yawn a little bit, saying, one more day? Yeah, I already knew that. I already heard about that. Every Christmas, you guys talk about that. If I were to tell you that the king is coming today, how would you prepare for it? A few months ago, we talked about John the Baptist coming, saying, prepare the way for the Lord. you got to be prepared, because when the king comes, the king is going to clean house. The king is going to bring the kingdom, and only righteousness is going to make it into the kingdom. So if you don't have the perfect righteousness of God, you are not going to make it. Prepare the way for the Lord. Every crooked way needs to be made straight. Every hill, every mountain will be brought down. <clears throat> Prepare the way for the Lord. If the king were to come today, are you prepared? You see, God in his mercy, in his marvelous mercy, told us the king was coming. But in his marvelous mercy, the king came first to seek and save the lost. The king came not to judge, but the king did come looking for those who would have faith. And ironically, it wasn't the religious people, it wasn't the powerful, it wasn't the kings, it wasn't the priests, it wasn't the Pharisees who knew so much Bible. It wasn't them who welcomed the king. You know who it was? It was the little children. It was the sinners, it was the tax collectors, it was the women of ill repute. It was everybody that was marginalized under this oppressive system of power and religion. And when the, ki when the little kids were running around with branches and palms, you know what the religious people said? Rabbi, you got to tell them to stay quiet. This is not appropriate for Jerusalem. This is not appropriate for the temple. And you know what Jesus said? If these little ones were to be quiet, even the stones would cry out. The very stones that John the Baptist said God is powerful enough to raise children of Abraham from because you are not children of God. Because the children of God are excited about the presence of God. The children of God cannot wait for dad to show up from work, to cling around his knees and say, Daddy, Daddy. And the king has come came looking for fruit and when he came to the fig tree you know what he found nothing but leaves nothing but leaves if he comes into our lives what will he find the king came to seek and save the lost but he promised he would come again to bring his kingdom to rule to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end that's what the creed proclaims right his kingdom is coming back, but when he comes back, Jesus said, will the king find faith on earth? What's he looking for? Faithfulness. Not perfection. We're in a process of transformation. We're being sanctified. 
that he's coming to look for faithful people. Will you be faithful when the king shows up again? One of the Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, he tells a story about what happened one day when Jesus was invited into a home. He came for dinner one time. He sat reclined at the table, and there, she, there he is. <clears throat> and then a woman who was a sinner came to, to the house of the Pharisee. It was the house of a religious leader, a prominent leader, a Pharisee. This woman who was a sinner, and everybody knew who she, who she was. Everybody knew she was somebody you didn't want to be with. In fact, her sins were such that if you were to touch her, you would become ceremonially unclean. And then if somebody else touched her, it was a problem. You, that's the kind of person you don't want around. And this woman gets close to Jesus. And you know what she does? She sticks by his feet. And she starts just crying and crying and crying on Jesus' feet. She must have had long hair or she must have got really, really close because she started drying his feet all the tears with her hair. And as she's humiliated as low as it can be to the position of a slave, you know what people are thinking? Well, I can tell you what the Pharisee is thinking because the Bible says the Pharisee is thinking in his heart, this one, Jesus, if he really was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner, but he clearly has no clue. But Jesus knows the heart, right? And he knows the mind. Every time he looks at you and me, he sees right through. Our thoughts, our intentions, our wants, our desires, he sees right through. Every one of us. So Jesus tells Simon, the Pharisee, he says, Simon, i got a question to ask you. Master, tell me. <laughs> All appearances, right? We're so nice to each other. Good morning, brother. <laughs> Jesus says, there were two debtors of this guy. One owed a million dollars. The other one owed a hundred dollars. And neither of those had any money to pay the, the master. So they were going to be taken to jail or whatever. But the master decided to forgive them both. So let me ask you this. Of these two, which one is going to love him more? And the first is like, duh. Well, the one that was forgiven more, right? <laughs> you would think, right? You have no idea, Simon. You have no idea of what the price of sin is. You think you're so good, right? You think you're better than her? You think you're much better than this sinful woman? And guess what? You don't even realize the enormity of what you owe. It is that big, the owe the death that you have. He says, okay. You've just, you've just rightly. I'll just tell you this. You see this woman right here? I know what you're thinking, Simon. You think I don't know, right? You, you think I don't know what you do during the week? You think it's okay just to come Sunday, look good, but during the week you don't think I know? You see this woman right here? I came into your house. You didn't greet me. You didn't give me a kiss. You didn't wash my feet, which is the smallest courtesy that even a slave would have done, right? You didn't do any of that. But this woman, ever since I came, she's been kissing my, my feet and, and washing them with her tears. Therefore, I tell you that her sins, which by the way you write, are many. Therefore, I tell you that her sins are forgiven. Are forgiven. Those who much is, are forgiven, they love much. So let me ask you this. How much do you love? How much do you love? Because that cry out, Hosanna, is not a cry of desperation just because you're in trouble saying, oh gosh, I have to pay my credit cards. Lord Jesus, come, I don't want to pay that. No, no. Hosanna is a hard cry of love. It's a hard cry of those who know what it is to be forgiven and cannot wait to see the king, the one who saved them, the one who loved them, come back so we can say, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Let me kiss your feet. Let me, let me cry as long as it takes in your presence. Because I was broken. I was sinful. I was sick. I was dead. And you gave me life. This is precisely... How 2 Peter 3 ends, telling us the king is coming. And because the king is coming back again to bring the kingdom, whatever we experience here, if we live for him, whatever we go through, 
cannot possibly compare with the glory that is to come. The king is coming. And God's people say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Can you say that? And, and let's say like we mean it. And say it like you love him. You're getting there, right? You see, it takes hope, takes time, and suffering, and patience, and intentionality. Hope doesn't happen simply just because. Christian life is a fruit that happens when you walk with Jesus. A little while ago, somebody asked me, Pastor Miguel, what do you want to say in the FPC in about five years? I'm like, oh, that's a great question. Hmm. Every single time I, I keep coming back to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where Paul says, now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of this is love. You know what I want to see at the FPC? Not what I want to see. I want us to be what God wants us to be. And you know what I, I'm persuaded God wants us to be? God wants us to be a faithful community and faithful individuals. Faith at the foundation of our lives. Faithfulness. God wants us to be the most hopeful kind of people. Not toxic, not complaining, not backbiting, not backstabbing, not social media driven, Bible driven. Holy Spirit indwelled. That every time we talk, we speak with soul, that people hear the word of God and see the word of God lived in our lives. That's hopeful. God wants us to be faithful to him. And when you're faithful to him, you're going to be a hopeful person. You know why? Because the kingdom is coming. And when the kingdom comes, it doesn't matter what this broken world has. He's going to make it all new and it's going to be all right. Faithful, hopeful, and when you cling to Jesus and when your faith is, is perfected in patience and perseverance and hope, guess what's going to happen? By this they will know you're my disciples. If you love one another, our childish ways will mature into the loving ways of Jesus Christ. We will experience the fruit of love. Faithful, hopeful, loving. That's what, what God wants out of the FPC. So that's what the process is all about. The kingdom will reveal what we truly become, but this is the time to become what we preach the kingdom is. So if you want to, if you want to go with me, I'll invite you to open your Bible. Second Peter chapter three tells us and closes this letter with this legacy of Peter. Peter has been encouraging us in chapter one to stay faithful. Remember, discipleship is a growing process. Add to your faith, knowledge and virtue, all those seven steps of growth. You have a faith that has been given for God. He, it's a gift. Now keep it. Embrace it, persevere, keep growing, become like Jesus, chapter 1. Chapter 2, there will be dangers. Sadly, dangers from the inside, false teachers. Resist the tide of idolatry, resist the tide of immorality, resist the easy sensual appeal of teachers that just want to tickle your ears. Cling to the word of God. Cling to the community of people that listen to God's word and discern. There will be challenges, but stay faithful. You know why? Because even though there are scoffers coming saying, ah, don't take this too seriously. The kingdom is coming. The king is coming back. And when he comes back, when he comes back, he, he wants to find you faithful and he wants to find you hopeful. Now, the question as he closes the letter is, how do we stay hopeful? How do we stay hopeful when the tide is so strong? Sometimes it pulls you, right? You don't want to be negative, but if you watch the news, I mean... How many good news do you read weekly? So very few. And social media, every once in a while you get a nice glimpse, right? But, but it's so overwhelmingly negative. How do we stay hopeful? Well, Peter is going to close his letter today saying, you know what? I'm going to tell you a few things that will help you stay hopeful. I'm going to tell you a few, a few things that will help you love knowing that you are forgiven. I'm going to tell you a few things that will help you be faithful, knowing that your king knows you're in process, and he's never, ever, ever going to give up. Never to the end. So cling to him. As long as you cling to Jesus, there's no way to go wrong. But if you stop following him, that's when things get really hairy. So Second Peter chapter 3, verse 11 says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of, the, of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will, be, will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth 
in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for this, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as, as a salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and stable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen and amen. So the question we've been dealing with faithful to the end is, by God's grace, faithful followers of Christ persevere to the end. Now, I just said the question, right? I do realize that's not a question, that's a statement. But here's the thing. The whole, th the whole theme of Second Peter is this. If you already have faith in Jesus Christ, the faith that the Christian has is a faith that remains, is a faith that perseveres, is a faith that grows into hope, and hope turns into love. So this faith remains. If you're somebody that's just here today and not tomorrow, if you say you're a follower but your lifestyle is inconsistent, if your doctrine is not biblical and your lifestyle is not biblical, we have a big problem. So the whole point of Second Peter is, is an encouragement by God's grace to be faithful till the, end, till the end. So how do we do that? How do we stay faithful to the end? In this letter at the end, Peter is going to tell us today that God knows we're in process. And God knows our brokenness. And God knows how inefficient and ineffective sometimes we can be. But God wants us to stay the course. Because just as Paul has told us somewhere else, remember Philippians chapter 1? He who began the good work, what will he do? He will, he's faithful to finish it. He's faithful to complete that work, right? Until the day of Christ. The day of Christ for the Christian is the day where everything gets paid. It's in the Old Testament. The equivalent is the year, the year of Jubilee. Remember the Jubilee? All debts are canceled. All slaves are free. It's the day of freedom. When Jesus Christ comes back, whatever you're lacking, your character is not like him yet. He is going to complete it. So there's no way to go wrong. It is the biggest day of freedom in the universe. When the king comes, he's going to set this, this creation free from sin. And it will be good. So that's why you and I can be faithful to the end. And he's going to give us three pieces of encouragement to think about. So, faithful followers of Jesus persevere to the end, knowing that God's grace is working in three particular ways. The first one is this. It's turning our brokenness into spotless righteousness. Did you notice those verses in, in verse 11 to verse 13? And by the way, before I say this, this is a super interesting part where one of the apostolic writers acknowledges that he doesn't have the whole picture, right? Who's he acknowledging right here at the end? Right there in verse 14, right? Our verse 15 says, also our beloved brother Paul has written. Peter is making reference to Paul. And he is calling Paul's writings scripture. Did you notice that? Just like the other scriptures, your New Testament was inspired by the Holy Spirit, just the way the Old Testament was. The apostles and the prophets, inspired by the, by the Holy Spirit of God, gave you the thoughts of God, the words of God, so you and I could have a lamp to guide us in this life. So Peter is saying, I have a lot to learn too. I'm not done either. Did Peter know about brokenness? Boy, did he, right? Boy, did he. Peter was somebody whose life transformation was unbelievable. He was rough, gruff, a leader of leaders. He was a go-getter. And how many times did he get it wrong? <sighs> Plenty of times. There was one that he almost gave up. Remember when he betrayed Jesus? He denied three times and he cursed that he knew Jesus. And Luke tells us that Jesus turned and looked at him. Can you imagine that? The bitterness, all that love that he felt for Jesus in a moment of weakness, denied. He almost dropped it. And Jesus lovingly and tenderly came back to him and said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Lord, you know everything was his conclusion. You know, you know what? That's a big, difficult lesson to learn. Let me ask you this. Does Jesus know better than you? 
Does he know better than me? Does he know better than all the religious establishment? Yes, he does. Because you don't follow a religion. You follow a savior, the King Jesus Christ, right? So when he comes to you personally, when he offers his forgiveness, when he offers to be with you until the end of time, he's going to make good on his promise. And Peter knew that. And Paul knew that. Every generation of Christians that has come before know that God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. And that's what Peter is going to tell us right here. He's telling us right there in verse 11. All the things, all these things, all this world, all your achievements, all your jobs, your academic credentials, your family relationships, everything you have right now that you value so much, guess, what, guess what's going to happen to that? When the kingdom comes, it's going to be dissolved. So if all this is going to pass and it's going to be transformed in such a way that evil is not going to be present anymore, how should we live then? How should we live then knowing that everything we invest here, unless it's an investment for the kingdom, is not going to make it? He says right there, since all these things, verse 11, are to be solved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Remember, we talked about holiness, meaning being set apart for God. When you are set apart for God, when you are living a life for God in the context in which you live, guess what? You are a representative of the age to come. Everywhere your foot lands, you represent the kingdom of God. You're an ambassador of God. Now, are you a perfect ambassador? No. In fact, what the kingdom is doing right here is telling the world the biggest and most hopeful story we can ever tell. If God can turn broken people like that woman, like you, like me, if God can turn our biggest pain, our biggest need, our biggest challenge into a sanctified instrument that looks like him, that's what godliness is, a life that resembles the life of God, if he can turn our brokenness into an instrument for his glory, guess what? He can give hope to anyone, to anyone. Just think about your own life. Where did Jesus rescue you from? Do you remember? Sometimes we don't remember because we think that Jesus hasn't forgotten much, right? hasn't forgiven much. We may be like the Pharisee, a lot of religion, a lot of ceremony, a lot of church life, but very little love. Very little love. And when Jesus comes as a king and looks into the fruit of your life, all that he sees is what? Leaves. But he's looking for fruit, faith, hope, and love. So, so Peter is telling us, you know what? You got to realize that God meets you in your brokenness, and God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So what he wants you to do, rather than to pretend to be okay, rather than to pretend with religion that you have some sort of special religious makeup, just be real. And little by little, allow him to set you apart, to tell the story of how he has turned your brokenness into an instrument for his glory. Because guess what? All of this is going to be dissolved. But it says, Live lives of live lives of God, holiness and godliness. He says, waiting for and hastening for the coming of the day of God. Ah, that's interesting, isn't it? How do you wait and and and, and haste at the same time? It's kind of like a a little bit of an oxymoron, right there, right? You wait. That that's kind of like patient and just still. Like I, I imagine a little kid just waiting right there patiently, but then hastening. Well, you're in a hurry, right? How do you do both at the same time? You wait. Because it's not on your timing, it's on God's timing. So whenever he says, it is when he says, right? Are we there yet? We'll be there when we get there. God will say when. However, that doesn't mean that you and I have to be idle. Last week we talked about how, how God is patient with us. And if we are to haste for the day of salvation, that, that means that we got to get our job done. So when our master finds us, he finds us faithful. So the hastening has to do with the mission that God has given us. Jesus said that his gospel has to be preached to all nations, right? So we have a job to do. When you wait patiently, you keep your cool, you stay faithful, you stay hopeful, you stay positive, but you and I have a job to do. If you want to haste the day of the Lord, he's going to make it happen in his own good timing, but get busy. You know when it seems really, really long? When we're idle. When we have nothing to do, minutes become hours, right? But when you have a full day of work and you're engaged and you're enjoying your job and you're doing what? Oh my goodness, it's already two hours. Time flies. Sometimes we get impatient because we're not doing what God's called us to do. And what is God calling us to do? 
to turn our brokenness into spotless righteousness. Why am I telling you this? Look at the end of these verses in verse 13. He says, according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. One day, the only thing that's going to make it into the kingdom is the righteousness of God. And by the way, that's not something we achieve on our own effort. That righteousness is the righteousness that Jesus Christ came to gain for us, right? A righteousness bigger than the Pharisees and the scribes. This righteousness is the imputed righteousness, the gift of justification given by grace through faith. When you embrace this righteousness, when you let this righteousness dress you and fill you and lead you in your everyday life, what you are saying is that God is taking your brokenness and turning into something beautiful. And what is that something beautiful? The likeness of Jesus Christ. True, good, and beautiful. And that's what the kingdom is going to be all about. So, we have the biggest message of hope. But not only that. Second thing. This kingdom, God's grace, is replacing our spots and blemishes with his peace. Look at what he says in verse, um, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for this, for this what? For the fulfillment of the coming of the kingdom. Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Hmm. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. You and I are not there yet. You and I are not perfect yet. But the main thing has already been done, hasn't it? Where was it done? At the cross. At the cross and that empty grave, God provided this perfect righteousness and is free for all those who want it. But in this process of sanctification until we'll, we, we fully become like Jesus Christ, there's a little bit of spot checking we have to do, right? You see, here on the stage, it's coming together, right? Great work. A lot of people have been working so hard, but it's not done yet. There's plenty of things we have to do. Those holes need to have the speakers. If you look at the wall, if you pay attention to the wall, because we painted the brick, there are little specks of white brick back there that need to be retouched. Guess what? That is the sanctification process that God is doing right now. There are little things in our lives that this process has to address, but in comparison to the big work of Jesus Christ, that's like nothing. And that's something that's as good as done because when Jesus, he's going to finish it up, no matter what, sanctification and glory for the believer are inevitable. Are the reality that God has promised based not on our effort, but on God's character and then the work of Jesus Christ. So, Peter is saying, if God's justice and if God's mercy and if God's grace are sure, guess what? Now we spend our time addressing the things in our daily life that may move us to live in ways that are contrary to who we truly are. It's spot checking. I love kids. Well, let me be honest, I love my kids. Kids are a little bit of a challenge for me, but my kids, I love my kids most of the days, most of the time, unless they find me in a time when I haven't confessed a sin and I'm not in fellowship with God and then blah, the flesh and all that. But anyway, that's another, that's another sermon. My kids are so vivacious, so rambunctious, so loving, and sometimes in their exuberance, they want to touch everything, and they want to touch everything with sticky hands. And when I have spent the day cleaning for a house to be clean, and with their sticky hands, they go on the windows, or they go on the counters, or they go and they spill things, that makes me <sighs> slightly frustrated. <laughs> Get the point, right? But guess what? God, in this respect, is probably more like my wife than me. When my kids are sticky, when my kids are spotty, when my kids are a mess, you know what mama does? Come here. <laughs> mama detergent, right? Wipes you, cleans you, come here. Well, my wife is more like the washcloth. I'd be like, the, you didn't do the licking, honey, just for this clarity, right? I want, I want to be happy there. But my mother used to do that with me. There you go, mama, you're in Mexico, so it's okay to say that. But uh, she sees me, though. I love you, mom. I'm getting so, in so much trouble, right? Finish the sermon, Pastor. So, the point is this. What God is doing with us is just cleaning those spots that get in the way when we get sticky hands in our daily walk. 
God is doing the laundry here while he takes us home and we're finally like him. And you know why God has allowed those spots to be here? Because we live in a very broken and spotty world. And he wants to show those who are spiritual orphans what a difference a daddy and a mommy can make. That is the difference our Heavenly Father does with us. If we sin, what do we do? First John chapter 1 says, When we sin, if we sin, we confess our sins, and He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what Peter wants you to know is that every time you have a spot or a blemish, you come running back to your heavenly daddy and says, Daddy, I got a boo-boo. I got a spiritual boo-boo. Help me. And you know what your heavenly father is going to do? Way better than I would, right? He's going to say, oh, I get no, that's me. Our heavenly father is like, you know what? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, there's plenty of grace and provision to make you spotless. Go play again, my son. Go show them what daddy does, right? God loves you like no other. And that's why Peter concludes saying here, you know what? As you're in this process of letting daddy take all these blemishes and all these spots, be found at peace. Peace, shalom. Peace is not absence of problems, right? That's not what it is. What is shalom? The presence of God. When God is there in your life, it doesn't matter what comes your way, God is going to grab you and he's going to hold you. And he's going to say, it's okay. I got you. I got you. Here, rest right here. On my chest. Right here. You are safe. So Peter says, I know I'm going to die soon, but God's given me peace. And Jesus said, right? Jesus said, a peace not like the world gives. A peace that remains. A peace that is grounded in God's provision through Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. God's grace is doing one more thing. It's turning our wayward ways into everlasting glory. Look at right there, verse 16. It's talking about Paul teaching us. He says, he does in all of his letters when he speaks in them in these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist for their own destruction. Unfortunately, there will be people here reading their Bible just little verses here and there, right? Just little messages for their own agendas. There will be plenty of false teachers. He told us that in chapter 2. There will be plenty of wayward ways. But he says, they are twisting the other scriptures as well. But you, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. There will be many ways trying to get you away from the way of the king. Hey, this is a lot more fun. Did you know that in Revelation, in one of the seven churches, there was a Sunday school class that was teaching people the, the, the deep things of Satan? I mean, they only have to do that in a quip here on Wednesday night, right? No! No, when you're church, you're not here to learn about the deep things of Satan. They're here to learn about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Even in the church already in the first century, there were people that were infiltrating the ranks with the teachings of Satan and demons and immorality and all this. And Peter says, sometimes some of you will go in that direction. But, but, but let, me, let me catch your attention one more time. says, when you miss your way, when you miss your step, when you realize that you, you're eating pig's food, and you remember that in your father's house there's plenty of food and plenty of life. When you hit rock bottom, remember who truly loves you. And guess what? Just like the prodigal, turn your way around, come back home. Come back home. Because when you do that, the father will be there to welcome you, to change those rags, to give you a ring, to make a party and say, let's keep growing. Let's throw a party. God will lavish his glory and his love on you. Because you know what? He's already told you that in the scriptures, hasn't he? You learned it a long time ago in Sunday school when you were like second grade. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. He will make your path straight. If you tell him, Hosanna, save me, he will. He will. And salvation means eternal glory. 
Are you ready to stay hopeful? Are you ready to be faithful? Are you ready to grow into a loving community that people will say, look at them. They must be Jesus followers because look how they love one another. Close with this. Don't let the ups and downs from the journey keep you from winning the race. Remain faithful and hopeful. Finish strong by his grace. Let's pray together. As you're praying today, we're about to come to the Lord's table. And right there at the table, Jesus is reclining. And he's come to bring forgiveness of sin. But some of us, like Simon the Pharisee, are looking at others and wondering who doesn't take the cup. Oh, they must be in sin. Hmm, I wonder what it is. But Jesus wants none of that to distract you from the fact that he's there to meet with you. And that if you want to come to him, doesn't matter what sin you're carrying, doesn't matter what brokenness you're carrying, he's going to meet with you. And he's going to give you forgiveness. If you're humble, if you come to him confessing, if you come to him, maybe you have never, never asked him to save you. Maybe today is the day. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, let me just tell you that's why he came. And what do you do? Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died for you and me, went to that cross, was buried, and rose on the third day to save you. All you have to do is like that woman, come and say, Lord, I am spiritually broken. I am bankrupt. I cannot save myself. Please forgive me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. Today I receive you in my heart. If this is you, why don't you talk to Jesus today? Maybe you already trusted Jesus a long time ago, but this journey has been long. Maybe you've forgotten how much He loves you, how much He's forgiven. Today is the day to come back to Him, to that first love, and tell Him, Lord, I love you. Thank you for your forgiveness. It's time to come at His feet and worship Him. So pray with me. Lord, I know the enemy is trying to discourage us, Lord, from following after you. There's so many ups and downs in our lives, Lord, but only your grace reminds us, Lord, that there's no way to go wrong and that we follow you because you love us, Lord. We love you because you loved us first. There is no way to go wrong with you. So we come to you today as we prepare to receive these elements, Lord, the bread and the cup, the symbols of your body, Lord Jesus, and your blood. Lord, first we confess that we need you, that you are our living water, you are the bread of life. We need you to live. Would you please cleanse us, Lord, from all unrighteousness? Would you please, Lord, let your righteousness grow more and more, Lord, in our lives, so that this world may see that you can turn broken people into saints. You can turn this death into your life. You can do it, Lord, because you're making new all things. So, Lord, we come to you.